This is a Commodore 64 power supply. Now you're probably thinking, well, whoop de can do. Um, but there is something a little bit different about this one. Uh, for starters, it is substantially heavier than any of the others that I've seen. And you're probably thinking, well, you know, they're all potted, but this is hollow. Obviously there's electronic components inside, transformer and that kind of thing, but it's not potted. And the reason it's so heavy is it's actually a steel box. Um, it's just got a, a layer of almost like faux leather stuck to the outside of it. So we're gonna open it up, see what's going on inside and see if we can actually use it safely. So it was held together by a couple of rivets, but I've already drilled them out because it didn't really make for riveting video. So let's open it up. I think the, the sides just sort of splay apart. Okay. It's a bit of rust, but nothing too serious. Inside we have obviously a big transformer that's going to be sending 9 volts AC, which would be these taps up here. And it's also sending a couple of taps to this board here, which is regulating our 5 volts DC. Uh, all in all, it looks okay. I don't see any components that are obviously damaged or burnt out, but... Um, you never know with these things. Um, yeah, the, the biggest risk with these bricks of death, and this literally is like a brick of death. I'm sure if you threw it at someone. Uh, the voltage regulator uh, can go short circuit and basically send the input current or the input voltage straight to the output, uh, which is usually around eight or nine volts. Um, and yeah likely to instantly kill a Commodore 64. Um, usually they sort of slowly do it over time. So um, they're like the silent killer, but let's plug it in. I think it looks pretty safe. Uh, obviously this is grounded. So an Australian plug, it's got a ground pin at the bottom because it's a metal case. So uh, apart from that, everything's pretty stock standard, I guess. The um, the DIN plug has seen better days, so we might replace that. And it's actually, there's little hints of green, what looks like lime scale on it. So yeah, that's, that's pretty nasty, but let's just plug it in and see what it does. Here we go. Well, it doesn't explode, so that's nice. Um, I'll have a quick look at some voltages. And this is just a, these are little tweezer probes. They come in quite handy for trying to probe DIN plugs. So on DC, we want to look at the, the bottom two pins. I can't remember if it's the pin to the right of the bottom. Yes, it is. 5.2, 6.2. Seven volts, so not terrible, but uh, it's definitely a little higher than I'd like. Uh, let's look at AC side of things. There shouldn't be an issue there. The transformer is obviously working. Oops. Nine point seven six. So that also seems fine. So it should be safe to plug this into a Commodore sixty four. I don't know if the microphone will pick that up, but you can actually hear it vibrating and you can really feel it. It's almost like a little massage. Um, that's fine. It's not a big concern. It's just something of interest. So the first thing I think I want to do is put a new DIN plug on here because yeah, that, that just doesn't look good. So, um, Let's lop this old one off and stick a new one on. And of course, unplug it. Let's just see what this tape was hiding. Oh, 
Oh yeah. Oh, uh, it's not actually any broken wires or anything. It is. It's just that the strain relief has broken off. Well, the the shielding under the strain relief has broken off and it's pulled open a little bit. So it's not the prettiest looking thing, but it's still safe to use. But um, it just yeah, it's not pretty. So we're we're just gonna replace it anyway. Right, so old plug is off and new plug is ready to go. I'm just going to tin these wires. Um, I haven't twisted the actual wires. Um, if, they're, if you tin them immediately after you strip them, then they should still be in a, a nice solid piece. So you don't have to worry about trying to twist them together. Now, before I forget, always put the um, the sheath on before you go soldering anything else. Here's our little DIN connector. Now, when soldering these, I usually use these helping hands and actually put the alligator clip on the other side of the pin that I'm soldering to. That sort of wicks away some of the heat and stops the actual pin from melting through the plastic because uh, then you end up with a useless plug. Ah, now the AC side of things is green and yellow. So those two are going to end up on top and which means blue and pink are going to be down the bottom. I might actually add a bit of heat shrink as well just to keep everything nice and neat yeah and then that'll sit over there like that I'll do the rest okay Slide that over there, do a quick stress test. Everything seems pretty solid. And I think I've got all the pins correct. Yes. So we'll just get a bit of heat on that heat shrink and we'll be done here. Right, we can put this back together. Uh, starting with this side. Oh, I can, in fact, that's the top side. That's what we want. So there's a little sort of clamp thing here um, that just sort of grabs all those wires. Obviously, you don't want to push it too tight and actually break through the, the insulation on the wires, but enough to sort of hold it in place. If I could hold my shit together, that would also help. And then this just goes on top and this slides over that little hole We'll line up with this tab that just needs to be pulled up a little bit just to stop it from the sheath from pulling back off. And there we go. That is our new plug. It certainly looks a lot better than the old one. The cable itself, it it's a bit rough, but it's actually, it just needs a clean, I think. I don't think it's actually damaged anywhere that I can see. And same with the the AC side, it's it's got all kinds of crap all over it, but it doesn't seem to be actually broken anywhere. So that should be good. Maybe we should try it on a real machine and just see what it does. Let's plug it in again. All right, well, that seems to work just fine. Um, speaking of dodgy DIN connectors, look at that video tin connector. Somebody should fix that. Uh, anyway, moving on. 
I do want to also clean this up, but I'm also thinking this is a good opportunity to put in a saver device, being as the, the five volts is a little bit higher than what I'd like. And as luck would have it, I do actually have some bits here. So this is one of BWAX C64 savers, revision 2.4. Uh, this actually came through Mindflare Retro. He, um, he did offer me to send me a few himself, but I actually turned him down and he ended up sending um, Mr. Lurch a couple. So I actually got this through Mr. Lurch, through MFR. And here's all the components. Now, I think the, the footprint is designed for like uh, one eighth watt resistors, but I just had quarter watt ones sitting around. So I might just have to sort of bend them a little bit, but there's, unlike most Commodore power supplies, there's plenty of room to fit this in here somewhere. So first things first, let's solder this together. I'm not gonna worry about uh, the 9 volt AC side of things um, because it's going to be inside this power supply anyway um, we're just going to use it for the DC, uh, the 5 volt DC side uh, I think that will work best let's see here so three 3.3 K's in R2, R3, R5 and what I should have actually bought is one of these you can get these PCB holders, but they've got a like a little arm that swings out, so it actually holds everything in place while you solder. That would have been a good idea in hindsight. All right, they're in place. Oh, I really should put this surface mount guy on. Uh, I think the way to do this, or the way I'm going to do it, is actually tin the big pad. Because I don't have um whatchamacallit? Solder paste, so I'm gonna attempt to do this with just the iron. And then, and this could be a little bit tricky. See if we can get enough heat through this tab. Just add a bit of solder to the top of this tab. Yeah, it's definitely moving now. Well, that's pretty secure, I'd say. I'm happy with that. Let's just solder its little legs. Now, uh, what else would we like to put in here? Let's do the 3.9K, which goes in R1 and R6. Oh, there's a hot leg, hot legs. All right, they all look pretty good. There's a decent amount of space between them and there's nothing really inside the case that's going to accidentally push those leads together and short them out so i'm not worried there ah uh, 330k which should be that three three bunch of zeros yep looks about right the capacitor 
And R882K, eight, that goes next to it. Hot legs. Yeah. Right, that's this guy, which goes this way, which means Q1 is little transistor package it goes here ceramic capacitor must go somewhere I don't know where that goes let's put the diodes in C2 there's Oh God, there's no spot for C2. That was a big fucking mess. Ah. So C2 has actually been removed from revision 2.4. So I guess we won't worry about that. So um, that is almost it. The only thing that's left to do is bridge these contacts here because uh, there's actually it's designed for an optional add-on board uh, and if you're not using that you just need to bridge these two pads in order to pass the five volts through to where it needs to go So just with one of those cut off legs, we're just gonna solder one of them in place and that will make our connection. And that should be it for the five volt side of things. Like I said, I'm not gonna worry about the nine volt side because normally you'd have this inside its own separate box in line in the power cord, but we're sticking this directly inside the case of the power supply. So it's not really necessary to, to hook up the nine volts just to have it coming straight back out again. We really just want that protection on the five volts. So um, let's insert it into the case and try and mount it somewhere where it's not gonna short to the case. All right, so we're getting very close. The board is now in place and mounted pretty much where I wanted it to go. I forgot that there's a screw hole that needs to remain open. So did have to push it to the side a little bit, but it still has enough room. And yeah, it's, it's protected from the, the metal case uh, and just stuck in there with some, some pretty strong double-sided adhesive just so I didn't have to drill any more holes in the actual case itself. Um, I sort of wanted to make sure the board was isolated from the, the metal case regardless. So that's pretty much good to go. We can, we can basically close this back up. Um, really the only thing left to do is clean up the rest of the case. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty filth. So I definitely want to get it cleaned up a bit. <laughs> here we go. I mean, I don't really need to put screws in here. It'll pretty much hold itself together, but um, you know, just for the, the sake of finishing everything up, I found a couple of screws that seem to fit just right. <laughs> Um, and I didn't really want to rivet it back together because if I have to open it again, it means I have to once again drill out more rivets. There. Uh, what to do about this label? There's a few nicks through the actual label. It looks like it's actually shifted out of place. You can see the original sticky crap here um i'm gonna try and remove it 
and reposition it. Like normally I'd use hot air just to soften up any adhesive, but it's 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 just that it's really thin. It's just like a piece of sticky tape, basically. I don't really want to destroy it. Okay, that is still salvageable, I think. Let's clean up this thing. I'm just going to use some um, citrus based solvent. It should remove any sticky residue or waxes. Well, it might remove sticky residue, but it's not really doing a very good job removing any dirt. All right, so I scrubbed at this thing for quite a while, but there were a couple of areas that just wouldn't clean up like I'd hoped. Um, so this is going to have to do it. I tried all kinds of different solutions to, to clean it up. And the label at the front, I actually put a bit of black tape uh, across the front and then stuck the label to that. So that sort of neatens it up quite a bit, but because the, the original labels lost some of its adhesive properties, it doesn't want to stick too well. Um, but it's still a definite improvement over what it was. So um, I guess the only thing left to do was try it out. Oh, I did also replace the, the original power cable because it's just so crusty and it just, yeah, that shit wasn't coming off. So new power cable looks quite nice. So um, yeah, this thing is ready for another test. And if I've wired everything back up correctly, we should have a pretty unique power supply um, that's also safe to power the Commodore 64 for however many years to come. So let's try it out, I suppose. All right, power supply is hooked up to the Commodore 64, which is hooked up to our little display back here. Uh, let's give it a try. LED came on, still works. It's still good. Cool. So this is a interesting little brick and one that I'm actually going to keep around. Um, this is a little bit noisier than I'd like, but at the same time, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, if anyone ever tries to, you know, steal my Commodore 64, I can always throw this at them because that's deadly. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. An unusual Commodore 64 power supply or brick of death.